thank Christopher for asking me to read the series, and Carolyn for hosting, and doing the review, and the Hunger Mind Cafe. Thank you. I'm Marguerite W. w. Sullivan. I'm going to read from a longer piece of fiction um, that I'm working on finishing, and what you need to know is it's about a character named Esther Hoke. She has returned from an absence to a town for, for an absence of about 12 years, and she's returned to a boarding house late at night. Uh, I'm going to read the second part of the introductory material about Esther, and that will go into a short couple of scenes with some other characters in the boarding house, Mrs. Benjamin, Vera Benjamin and her son Benny. She runs the boarding house, and another resident. <clears throat> so. The first chapter is called Likeness. No one hears tell of Esther Hoke. Her name spans this slender gap of what she's lived and what she has yet to live, a geography so narrow as to be nearly undetectable. She is not listed with motor vehicles divisions or insurance agencies. Her birth certificate is folded into four between pages of her old Schumann book, which is en route from Dunning with most of her music. Other numbers she may once have been assigned lie buried in envelopes, drawers, shelves, or other locations all unknown to her, really to anyone. It's impossible to think of all the people who know nothing of her or her papers her relationship with certain numbers, and so on. She never registered with the Musicians' Union, though she carries a bank book in her purse and checks the columns regularly. She has no address book, receives no Christmas cards, subscribes to no magazines. Even yesterday's bus ticket in her bag does not bear her name. When she is called upon to give a certain identifying number, she can see no reason not to give a number, and usually gives the same one with a full understanding that nothing she transacts with the world rests upon this number, which in turn means the number she gives will never be used to any meaningful purpose and can therefore claim the fictitious life she gives it. The phone number at Aunt Alice's house in Dunning was 627-8851. Her phone number at the Paget apartment all those years ago was 532-7619. These prompt a small, effortless refrain in her head, though she is conscious of a freedom from numbers that sets her apart. All information that might be gathered about Esther Hoke, from desks and files and drawers, all figures and records and notes and reports, would amount to a tidy rectangle no larger than a toaster. From it, nothing numerically succinct or germane would be learned, yet numbers teem through her like electrons. The number of gumdrops in a jar, 333, guessed correctly at the church raffle when she was nine, the first sign of her clairvoyance. Number of elastics worn on her braces, 535. The consumption of 2,119 grilled cheese sandwiches by age 30, who knows now what the figure is. Pages of books turned, stairs tramped upon, nursery rhymes recited, prepositions remembered, there are squares and triangles and hexagons to be constructed from her rolling position in space and time. Distances from sun and stars that hang from her neck in invisible cylinders. There are clocks that have carried her from here to there inside the even pulsation of katydids and hoot owls. Speeches with countless words and letters put away in ancient drawers. The proliferating beads of waking and the equally indeterminate crushed seeds of sleep. All these invisibilities prop her up and lay her out with endless interstices and apertures. Otherwise, she might turn to sand and be whisked along a windy shore. It is best to see her in a garden or on a beach. Behind her should move the incessant curl of turquoise waves or the swoop of tall, hotly colored zinnias. Her sight, slight figure stands straight in these pictures, slim but not frail, looking out to see her down the field. Her average feminine roundnesses take their grace from a slowness, an abstracted kind of unbelonging. 
The plainness of her clothes seems to locate her decades earlier. Can there be a straighter skirt of more plain camel color? Anything sillier than nude socks that grab and squeeze below the knee or these featureless shoes that resemble slippers? Her cotton blouses are not quite crisp and only come in ivory or blue, the occasional paisley. Her lank brown hair is pulled in a tone ponytail behind a round face made too large for her body by overwide mascarid eyes. A mole on her left cheek, a clove against the hairline creases of her skin, is sizable enough to seem theatrical. When she was 12, she tried a slew of substances from Aunt Alice's drawer to conceal what she considered the devil's fingerprint, a phrase she thought had issued from the lips of some old woman when she was little, though who or where never surfaced in her memory. Esther is located most of all by the tempo of the music she plays, nocturnes and sonatas, scherzos and rondos, capriccios, waltzes, etudes, tarantellas. The continual count of four and six and eight and twelve provides the place she is and tacks her into its hammock air. She chews her bread, draws a bath, writes a sentence, stifles a yawn, a yawn, according to the square corners of these rhythms. Time signatures drip from her hands as she waits for a bus or stands over a hot plate, a dry cadent rain. The middle of the night is evenly sheared into these pieces of cloth, like bookmarks for dreams. Even so, she must be seen in her remarkable state of unencumbrance, a body set adrift in the ordinary traffic of towns and roadways and street lamps and calendar squares, entirely unfettered, weaving like a gnat from here to there, afloat on the hum of strangers' colloquies, dropped from a late day thunderclap. She sleeps in this modest white bed, but no one knows she is there. No one sees her smallness, her forgetfulness. She sleeps in a dense gray fold of time, years of solitude pegged into her form. Hours pass in this unencumbered state, then the morning trickles into being in bits of fuchsia cloud. As this day dawns, her search begins, a search for lost time and all the things in it. Once morning arrives, her solitude will become compromised. People will begin to gather around her, people who are yet to know her, people who recollect her, people who have found it preferable to forget her. All of them will carry her inside their own language, draw her in unbefitting and disproportionate lines and angles. Even in her sleep, she understands the story is no longer hers. She will be altered by their gaze, scripted by their flaws. She will be overheard, doubted, misinterpreted, and passed over. She will be handled by expectation and apparition. She will come to represent something wholly other than herself in other stories. She will be required to start over with what is already dead and gone. Her narratives will coagulate in her throat, yet she will keep moving forward, stripping the shadows away. As she opens her eyes, sunlight cuts across earthbound things, playing orange and very white along the tips of spruces, maples, ash. Greens let go of their dark, Shadows fall in quick columns. The whole elephant of a town begins to quiver in jellied limbs. If there are sinister gestures among the birds, she cannot read them. If she hears the slow, tiny slush of cocoons being shed, she may recognize an echo of things already told. The rabbit, rabbits nibbling in the dew cannot tell her story, and the doves paired on telephone wires can sing only the same three notes in a horrible fugue of premonition. But she must wake up. Her own narration must get into costume, wash its face, wait its turn. This early portrait is already old and done, an illustrious non-beauty who sleeps anyway inside the sound of her own prelude. Because it's important to know who she was, even after learning who she is fated to become. It's natural to ask that her figure hold its original light preserve this bare abstraction, sustain the innocence she so actively importunes, long after a thousand other tales have collapsed into chapters. So this is a scene the next morning, people. 
Chester has already retreated upstairs when Mrs. Benjamin finally returns to the table, sucks the paunch of her stomach in without much effect, then lets it ooze into the elastic jeans beneath her pale peach sateen blouse. It will be a while before she clears the breakfast dis dishes since there is usually no rush and today is no different despite the new boarder's arrival. Her son, seated at her right, eats without interruption. It's not possible to remember a plain, timid girl from a dozen years ago in a town this size, she says. She's seen him eat nearly every meal, which has made her too familiar with his tendency to gorge. Though this morning she won't go so far as to use the term gorge, it seems unkind. Yet often enough, there is no other word that suffices. She wipes her mouth again, her knuckles clotted with a series of yellow and silver rings, a great amber gem between diamond dots. She breathes out again to emphasize her observation, to wait for him to speak. He must always need to fight the tendency to gorge. That he could eat and eat without ceasing, this is one idea that fixes itself in her mind. His eyes look dull, but this has no effect on his chewing. She continues before he can swallow. Mrs. Hatt certainly was going on this morning. What was it about, Benny? Mrs. Hatt claims to know her. Miss Hoke, isn't it? Why not? Why is that so impossible? He spears a sausage. Mrs. Hatt is too old to remember such things, of all people. When she wants him to agree with her, he picks an opposite point of view. It's an old game, never mind. No point in being bothered. The way he says, Miss Hoke, the way that real estate woman always piles her homemade pastries into shapeless scraps. As if Mrs. Hatt could know left from right these days, she says. Your new tenant attended the conservatory when she lived here, said as much in her mousy way, he says, failing to look up from his plate. Yes, well, I don't understand the first thing about it. Couldn't get the woman to say a word. Mousy it is, all right. But why should she come back here? I asked her that. You heard me. Asked her several times. You can't say she wasn't evading me. Didn't have a credible answer, did she? The way she let my questions just lie there. Never minding. Well, all I have to say is, good God, mother, another spinster with her dreary clothes and sensible shoes. Why can't you get a dancer or a student in the martial arts? Anyway, I can't be expected to call her Miss Hope. What's her name? Vera Benjamin rolls a crumb between her fingers. He suffers, too, from a tendency to blurt out, just like the boy of him used to do, blurt out what shouldn't be said. So much might be fixed if she could just put a hand over his mouth. The old dissatisfaction comes into her tone. Her voice was thin on the phone, and then that girlish hairdo. I thought she would be younger, but then she's not, is she? <laughs> she's solidly in her 40s. You can't fool a single man. My intuition is never wrong, is it? The day is going to be warm. The heat interferes with her already poor sleeping habits, but the days are shortening. She watches him chew his mouth slightly open, and puts another piece of croissant in her own mouth. That's what a boarding house means, constant change, always an interruption to how things are. Poor old Mr. Hernwell must go off to the home, and this new woman comes along. The days are gone when she can afford to turn down tenants who have no references, some middle-aged girlish type with something to hide. She reaches over to pull dead petals from the foxglove and smiles stingily. Wrong? You? No, dear. Not ever. Not ever. Mrs. Hatt hears her name from the adjoining parlor, where she watches a game show and rocks her body in the straight oak chair. Her long thumbnails clack one over the other in time with the rocking. Those two are forever gabbing, Benny and Vera, Vera and Benny. Who would as soon talk of nothing as do anything? who would gossip and argue till the end of time, who wouldn't know how to keep still at their own funerals. She drowns them out with the names of show contestants mixed in with the name Esther Hoke. She repeats as many names as she can think of to the rhythm of her rocking body. Gradually, she hears herself saying the names of grade school companions, Tilly Wietzma, Gibby Ross, Ellen Condoris. 
The people she knew 70 years ago were perhaps the people she knew best of all. She sees their faces one by one, eternal in a blue haze. A line of sunlight cuts across the soft beige leather of her shoe and looks as though it might burn. He'll come and change the channel shortly. The same thing happens every day. He'll come in and announce the weather and fiddle with the television. The thought of his hulking shape, his insincere commentary, accelerates her rocking slightly. He will change the channel to something random, some sports show, some jibber-jabber she doesn't want. He does this invariably on his way upstairs. He will stare over her head and put his hand briefly on her shoulder and talk about the beauty of the day. His fancy words make a kind of dress over him, a gingham floral with little bows on the arms to cover up his brutishness. She likes to picture him in pink gingham. She can see him sweating and pumping beneath a pattern of flowers, putting it on thick. He puts it on like no actor she's ever seen. He creeps up the stairs like a weasel. He cleans his ears with a velvet gauze. The mother's a sticky wicket, fussy, nosy. The infections of the house, where her daughter put her four years ago, her own daughter, who lets her stay coop up, cooped up in this menagerie. But goodness, Esther Hoke has come to this house. Somehow, this has happened, hasn't it? Whom can she tell? They shipped the old man off without so much as a fairly well. They took him when no one was looking, ailing Mr. Hernwell with his liver spots and stories of submarines. Then they closed and locked his door before anyone could say a word. His drooping eye always gave her such a pang, such a horrible sadness. She had wanted to hold his hand, but had only ever given him a series of brittle smiles, useless fodder for the likes of him, who pro probably could barely see her. But I know this girl, she insists, as she picks seeds from her molars. I know that I do. The girl with the piano, these heavy Russian ballads in the morning. The girl who disappeared. There's no way to know how many years ago that was. All that funny business, what was it? Someone thought she was dead, or people said something strange had happened. The man never came, though. That was the strange thing. Never came looking for her, the boyfriend. But here she is, bobbing on the surface like an empty rowboat. She might have been carried in with the storms. The storms make my head hurt. The storms keep coming, even when the summer seems so quiet. There may be another one tonight. After all this time to see her here, what does it mean? The air between Mrs. Hatt's teeth slips and whistles. Her nails snap like eggshells. She knows a few things, she tells herself, because it's the coincidences in life that hold all the meaning. Thanks so much for listening.